Hello, and welcome to Partially Redacted, a podcast where we discuss privacy and security engineering and related topics. I'm your host, Sean Faulkner, and today I'm joined by Rock Garg, Principal at Bain Capital Ventures. And we'll be talking about industry trends and reflections in the privacy and security technology space. Rock, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Sean. It's really great to be here. Yeah, I'm glad that we were finally able to coordinate schedules, pull things off. Uh, I know you've been uh, sick and I've been sick. It, uh, it's, a, it's a challenge. It's the, the world we live in right now. Um, but, you know, we met uh, some time back when you had organized the developer relations leadership dinner in San Francisco, which was a great time. Thanks for, for doing that and for inviting me. It's funny, at the dinner, I'd actually never met anyone previously uh, from that dinner. But since then, I feel like I've run into like half that crew on like a monthly basis all over the world from like Vegas to Croatia. Uh, I guess we're kind of on the same event schedule or something. But uh, I would love to kind of dive into your background. I think you have a really interesting background that feels like a good jumping off place. So could you introduce yourself, maybe share a little bit about your education background and how you got to where you are today? Yeah, sure thing. And it was great to have you at the dinner. I feel like uh, it, was a, it was a really great time. So I, I grew up coding and building websites and apps. Uh, you know, I grew up in the Bay Area. I was always sort of obsessed with computer science and started off building little games and, and widgets and things to help me do my homework and just kind of moved out from outwards from there towards, uh, you know, building general purpose apps for people to use. So I went to UCLA after high school and computer science was a very natural fit for me. I found myself uh, very interested in super low level infrastructure. I took a bunch of cryptography courses, did a bunch of work in security at the, the research level, um, and also found myself gravitating towards entrepreneurship. So after college, I worked at Atlassian for a few years as a product manager. I felt that was a really good blend of being entrepreneurial, but also being technical. And I got really lucky at Atlassian. We were transitioning from this on-prem company to cloud SaaS company. And there was a ton of privacy and security and administration work that we had to get done, both for customers and internally to pull that off. And I got to play a leadership role in, in a bunch of that work. So spent a bunch of time doing that and then left Atlassian after close to three years to join Bain Capital Ventures, where now I invest in developer tools, privacy and security tools, and data and machine learning tools. Awesome. That's kind of a, the perfect mix of background for, for this show. But uh, so, you, you know, you mentioned that you you kind of started your career as an engineer um, and something that you had developed. You started basically doing that kind of stuff as a kid. And then you eventually moved the product, leading product at Atlassian. Was the Atlassian Access product that you led, that was kind of your first time working on something related to data security? Yeah. So how was that experience? Can you talk about you know, some of the challenges of leading product for Atlassian as they were making essentially that move from on-prem to, uh, you know, SaaS-based cloud in terms of uh, data security? Yeah. So, you know, Atlassian, and, and this is going back to about 2017, it was already a pretty ubiquitous company. I mean, everyone knew Jira. Jira was being used in a lot of different places. Confluence and Trello, same thing. But the issue was that customers didn't really have a good way to figure out if the things they were putting inside those products, so roadmaps and Jira or product requirements documents and Confluence or uh, you know feature specs in Trello, they had no way to figure out who was looking at it. Was it the right set of people? Could they make sure that it wasn't being exfiltrated? And if they suspected any wrongdoing you know, happening, they wouldn't actually be able to go back and figure out had that wrongdoing occurred or not. And this is a really big blocker for customers moving from on-prem to cloud because that auditability is something that becomes really important in the cloud. When it's on-prem, you can put it behind the firewall. You can sort of trust that as long as the environment is safe, that app is also going to be safe. And you don't have the same safeguards in the cloud. So access was challenging because we've got this long tail of products. Atlassian's got over 10 products. I think now it's closer to 15. Each of them have their own policy enforcement mechanisms. Each of them have their own conception of what is data, what is PII, what can be protected, and how granular you can get with that. And then all of the alerts that are thrown off from those policies are also different. So there's no API to query all of these things at the same time. Access became the single pane of glass for IT admins and CIOs and security people to create and set policies once for their users, regardless of the products that they were using within the suite. And that gave them a lot of leverage because suddenly you could have 
one API token for a user that you could control the scope of across whatever product or set of content they wanted to access. And then we also built a unified API to do all these things programmatically. And you know, if you were a security person, you could feed that API into Splunk, do event stream, uh, you know, anomaly detection and, and log management. You could feed it into a CASB or a SaaS security solution like Better Cloud or you know, Sky High Networks, which McAfee acquired back in the day. And you could set policies for the Atlassian suite along with all the other SaaS apps you used. And so it was really just like a gateway to security and data protection if you were using any of the products within the Atlassian suite. Yeah, I think what you talked about there, the the um, really that transformation and kind of the way that you need to think about essentially governance or controlled access to data changes significantly when you're moving essentially from that on-prem world to the cloud-based world. I remember when I first started my career in engineering, like all of our uh, you know bug ticketing software was essentially running on a like joint database behind the scenes and everything was running on prem but there's so much information about the actual business um in the internals of how things work that exists within that bug system but it's behind a firewall running on everyone's machine you know this there's a limited amount of exposure that could happen but you certainly suddenly put that online and suddenly you need all these things like logging access control know who's actually accessing the information and be able to proactively detect um, uh, you know, misuse essentially through things like abno- uh, 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 um, anomaly detection and so on. Yeah, I think it's a really salient point. And, you know, in some ways, this is actually a better world to live in than the one before, because in the world where everything was behind the firewall, you had to worry about how your firewall was set up and you had to worry about your network and you had to figure out if the policies that you had used for your network uh, were conducive to the way your apps were set up. And that's that's why we had VPNs. That's why we had these sort of centralized choke points where, you know, if an attacker got into your environment, suddenly it was like having the keys to the kingdom and they could move laterally, you know, into any app or any any piece of infrastructure. So with the cloud, we shifted focus away from infra to identity. And so now it's, it doesn't really matter where you're connecting from. I'm not filtering your IP. It doesn't matter what device you're connecting from. To me, as, as an Atlassian sort of IT admin, what matters is, can I verify that you are who you say you are? And can I verify that you should be able to see the things that you want to see? So authentication and authorization, right? Uh, companies like Auth0 uh, and Okta did a really great job with authentication. But authorization, I think, is still a really unsolved problem for a lot of companies. You know, you have to roll your own RBAC, you have to roll your own permissioning systems, your own policy enforcement systems, and all of that just gets continually harder as these these products get more complex and their surface area grows. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, we've had a few past guests as well, in particular, uh, a couple of uh, architects from Google that talked a lot about this, um, the advantage of the cloud as well, where essentially... The, the advantage you have there over on-prem is that a lot of the best practices from like a security and privacy posture can be baked into the product. So as long as you're sort of utilizing the right components, you it actually it can be more secure than essentially the on-prem solution. And you know, in terms of authentication and authorization for those, um, as you started to build those things at Atlassian, was that all custom built or were you leveraging uh, existing authentication tools, uh, third-party services? So Atlassian was an early customer of Auth0s, uh, which I, I believe is public information. And you know we were using Auth0 to manage all of our customer identity. But that's only one half of the problem. The other half of the problem is user identity. And so we were using, um, you know, we, we had built out connectors to different identity providers and SAML uh, to handle that. And so most of our customers were using either the Google Cloud to do authentication, or they were using Okta to do authentication, or they were building, uh, you know, using SAML, their own connectors to a long tail of other identity providers. But we found that, you know, really the only abstraction you have in an identity provider is users and groups to control data and and data security, which actually kind of works if it's a startup or if it's a very small organization, or if that instance is sort of scoped to a small set of people. But as companies grow and as data footprints grow and you know, putting this in the context of product-led growth, what happens is one engineering manager finds Jira, starts to use it, and then 
within a year, you know, a hundred people at their company are on Jira. As, as that sort of happens, users and groups become very, uh, you know, sparse. And it, it's really hard to manage who has access to which things and which products just with users and groups. Yeah, so how did you go about developing essentially more fine-grained control for Atlassian access? The, the first thing we did was we created this concept of an Atlassian account. So like I said earlier, you know, from on-prem to cloud, the focus has shifted away from your infrastructure and your environment towards identity. We had a philosophical shift internally where you, you now had a unified Atlassian account. You would log in once and those same credentials, that same account, that same you know, user ID would be used across all of the products that Atlassian has. And that does a bunch of things. One, you can simplify uh, a lot of your log management that way because a lot of the events that are triggered by that user are tied to the same user identifier. And second, if you know that this person is the same person across a variety of products, you can start to do more surveillance and auditability around their activities within that product. So with access, that account was sort of the, the prerequisite. We had to know that it was, it was this concept of shared identity across all the products. And then once we had built that out, then we could say, okay, this person has looked at this Jira ticket. They have access to these Confluence pages. They're making pull requests in Bitbucket. And, and suddenly that, that data story starts to get more unified. And then you can do more interesting things with it. Um, and then at the application layer, you know, we had built out a number of things with embedded analytics. So there were a number of dashboards that would show admins, uh, you know, here's some risky behavior, like maybe impossible travel time is a very common one. We had a, a unified API that would uh, work very nicely with Splunk. And so if you were using Splunk as your, your SIM for event management, uh, it would very nicely tell you, you know, what detections it, it found within the Atlassian suite and, and so on and so forth. But that's all sort of downstream of this concept of an account. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I think that really helps paint a picture of also like all the things you really need to think through when you're doing something like Author, uh, authorization, essentially, uh, in, in, you know, data governance and controlling access to different information. And that's really just like one component of data security. Uh, there's just so much stuff that you know, or you, you really need to think through and make sure that you're doing all the right things to really uh, improve sort of your, your product standpoint from a pro uh, security and privacy posture uh, perspective. So you've since moved away from product roles in industry to investing what sort of motivated that move for you? Yeah, you know, I really enjoyed product management. I felt like it was this really good blend of being creative, being entrepreneurial, working with customers to figure out issues, but staying close to the technology. And especially at a company like Atlassian, where there's so much to build at the architecture level, uh, you know, it was a really, really good blend for me. I just kept feeling the pull towards working with startups and early stage founders. And it was, it was a bit of a gradual move for me a really close friend of mine had gotten into Y Combinator as a founder, and I not only angel invested, but I also just started helping him out with things like enterprise monetization and how he should think about building privacy and security features for, for some larger companies versus balancing that with smaller companies and their needs. And, you know, he introduced me to more founder friends of his, and it just kind of got started that way where I kept working with the founders in my spare time. And you know, I'd be at my day job and I just kept feeling the pull of wanting to work with all these different people and all these different types of problems. And at the same time, you know, it, it just felt like so many companies were having to reinvent the wheel on things like SSO and privacy. It didn't make any sense to me. And I felt like being a VC would help me figure out why that is. And if there was a way to sort of solve these issues for companies at, at large. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's fantastic. The, it, uh, in your experience, like, how has the landscape of startups that are focused sort of on privacy and security changed during your time, you know, potentially in the industry to also being on the investment side of things? Yeah, you know, I, I think the biggest thing is this concept of a shift left, which we talk about a lot in security, right? So in security, shift left meant that instead of looking for security issues after they'd already occurred, we were shifting that detection upstream to before an application was actually deployed. And so developers would now have the option and, and you know, the ability to 
figure out if the code and the apps that we're creating were secure. And SNCC has been a huge sort of educator and, and you know, market force in that world. I think the same thing's happening in privacy. So, you know, companies in this field exclusively used to be GRC type companies where uh, people in compliance departments would set up policies and they'd set up controls and standards. And once a year, twice a year, or maybe every quarter, they'd hire a bunch of auditors to come in and figure out if they were compliant against the controls that they had set for themselves. But the issue is that if a breach has happened or if your IT stack isn't set up the right way and, and people are extracting data out of that stack, then no amount of controls is going to solve that problem, right? And, and you've inherently sort of relegated yourself to capturing that issue after it's already occurred. I think in this new world, what's happening is that privacy companies are going far deeper into the stack than they used to. So we're seeing companies focus more on data and on data infrastructure at much lower levels of abstraction, where now there's APIs to classify data. You don't have to build in-house classification. There's APIs to redact data, right? So there's, um, there, there's matchers for things like PII and social security numbers and credit card numbers and healthcare information and so on and so forth. Uh, we're figuring out breach detection. Companies like Wiz are helping companies um, you know, see infrastructure sprawl and misconfigurations in infrastructure before they occur. And so I think there's just much more of a focus on engineering practice and engineering culture and workflow and privacy where there wasn't before. And so we're catching these issues before they actually occur, before the risk has been, has been paid, essentially. Yeah, I feel like it's, there's been a shift to privacy becoming essentially like an engineering challenge. And if you look at, I think, the history of uh, engineering innovation, you know, the engineering industry has been very good at solving these types of problems, these types of challenges from first principles at scale. But historically, it really hasn't been an engineering problem. It's been more of, uh, as you mentioned, these like regulation, regulators, auditors, and more focused purely on sort of compliance as a checklist rather than fixing the underlying problem. Hey there, Sean here. I hope you're enjoying this episode of Partially Redacted. If so, please subscribe so you can always check out the latest episode and help others find the show by leaving a rating and review. Final thing before I get you back to the interview. If you're interested in privacy and security, have a challenge or issue you want to discuss, or want to share your expertise, please join the Partially Redacted community at skyflow.com slash community. All right, now back to the show. So what do you think has changed that has led to, I guess, this shift in the way that companies are thinking about, you know, data privacy? Like, why is it that this is now kind of be, the shift left movement essentially is happening? Yeah, I think it's a confluence of factors, right? So the first thing is regulators, I think, still have a, a part to play in this ecosystem where, you know, the advent of GDPR and subsequently CCPA and a number of other privacy frameworks have sort of turned the heat up on companies to for, you know, force themselves to think about when we hit scale and you know, someday we will, we're going to have to worry about these things. So let's engineer for it today. I think that's the first thing. Um, the second thing is there is this rise of the developer effect that we've seen where companies as vendors are realizing that sales is getting harder and harder. Every sales cycle is increasingly noisy vendor procurement is getting harder and harder. And so going straight to the developer, to the person implementing the technology you're going to sell, actually decomplexifies a lot of these go-to-market processes. And there's a number of ways to do that, right? You could do it with content and then do a top-down sale, which is what Wiz does. You could go straight bottom-up, which is what uh, you know companies in the password list space have seen success with because developers don't want to build authorization authentication over and over and over again. Um, or you can open source and have developers you know, host you themselves on their infrastructure, and then one day hopefully migrate up to some hosted enterprise cloud offering. But going straight to the developer, I think, has, for go-to-market reasons, has accelerated the, the technical uh, prowess of a lot of the privacy companies. And then I think the last thing is really just data is proliferating at a pace that is only accelerating. And so the sprawl has kind of made it impossible for people in compliance and GRC and traditional security to kind of keep up. So you have to go to where data is being created 
and all of that is the infrastructure. It's where developers are. And so by focusing on the source, you inherently kind of shift left because you, you have to worry about how can we uh, ensure that we're securing the data at the time of creation instead of now it's out there, let's figure out how we can do damage reduction. Yeah, so you work with you know a lot of founders, a lot of startups that are developing new types of products. You know, what sort of advice would you give to them in terms of how they think about this from, from day one? Is this something that they should be focusing on now or given all the you know things that they have to essentially try to balance and, and prioritize with limited set of resources versus something that they can you know retroactively kind of try to fix down the road? Yeah, it's a, it's a really good question. And I find that it's a balancing act for the type of customer and the type of product that you're building. So the, the root of this is, you know, you should focus on, as an enterprise founder, a singular workflow that you can really own end to end and be 10x better than whatever the existing sort of status quo implementation of that workflow is. And there are going to be bigger companies that sort of jerk you around in lengthy procurement processes. As, a, as an early stage founder, I tend to recommend for my companies to uh, just focus on forward thinking, leaner companies that aren't going to drag them through these processes and instead are just going to use the product, give them really valuable feedback that they can use to expand outwards from. So, so how does security and privacy fit into that? It's, it's definitely super important. I think it's easier than ever to include these features from day one now. Like if you're trying to build RBAC and OTC, you can use OSO or Warrant or Permit or a number of other companies that are in that space. And you can do that with a few lines of code, right? So it's super easy to stand up these systems now. If you're trying to build SSO, you can use WorkOS. If you're trying to do PII separation and redaction, you can use Skyflow or VGS or a number of other companies. And so I, I think the good news is that this enterprise readiness stack isn't something you have to build from scratch anymore. So the question is not, should we build it? The question is, when should we worry about integrating with these products? And to answer that question, I would think about how your customer base expands. Are, are you realistically in a place to go win a large company that needs all these administration features? Or are you still building for a single player use case? Because a lot of these things come into play when you're expanding from single player to multiplayer, and you can sort of drip feed these features to customers over time as you expand into you know, bigger teams and then orgs and then eventually companies. Have you seen a you know, more interest, I guess, from institutional investment for companies working in the privacy and security space versus, you know, a few years ago? I, I definitely think there's much more institutional interest in, in this space now. And I think it's because, you know, the outcomes are just so much larger when privacy is such a big issue these days. And, and the outcomes are larger because one, it's way harder to deal with privacy engineering. Two, we're seeing a new role Right, so DevSecOps engineers are a new role, privacy engineers are a new role, and, and companies are devoting more and more headcount to these kinds of teams. And then three, these problems are really only getting worse. So there's still a proliferation of regulation that overlaps in different ways. There is still a proliferation of uh, breaches that happen as a result of stolen credentials or, or other ran ransomware wedges or techniques. And so I think the problem's only getting worse, which means the market size is only going up. And then I think the second thing is, you know, just in data security posture management, these are companies like Eureka and Sierra and, you know, a number of others, Laminar is another one. I think over $250 million were invested in just that space last year over, you know, 2022. And so we're seeing a ton of institutional interest. The question is, how do these companies sort of become dominating platforms in that space? And that, that's the question that we try to answer. Yeah, well, if you have any secrets on that, let me know. <laughs> um, what uh, you know, what trends are you seeing in the security space and privacy space that you're excited about? Yeah, I think we talked about a few. So, you know, I'm really excited about the future of this intersection of security and, and developers. And I think we've really we've really only scratched the surface of how that delivery model becomes possible. So, for example. Um, you know, Sneak really showed that SCA or software composition analysis uh, was this thing that wasn't annoying to developers. For the longest time, it was super frustrating. 
there's a lot of other parts of the supply chain that we can secure and reinvent in those ways, like CI/CD security, container signing and container security, runtime security, um, you know, infrastructure security, all, all those sorts of things. So I'm really excited about what new companies will emerge that make those processes easier for developers. I think the second is, I'm really excited about the future of embedded companies that enable privacy. So like I said, every vendor out there is building the same things over and over and over again. And small problems in those implementations can have giant consequences. And so it feels like there should be a set of companies that basically do what Twilio did for telecom, but for privacy, right? And there, there's a number of companies that I think are doing really well in that space from Gretel and Tonic and synthetic data to uh, you know, private AI and, and security and, and breach detection. And I think the third thing is we're really only scratching the surface of AI ML in production, which creates new zero day exploits for privacy and security. So one is, you know, you could exfiltrate privacy data from a machine learning model that was trained on PII, for example. And researchers are trying to figure out how to protect against that. And the second is, uh, you know, you could have poison training data. And so if the training data itself is poisoned, all the inferences from that model are going to be unreliable and also poisoned. And so th these are, you know, these are new challenges in AI safety and security that I think we'll have to think about. Yeah, that's really interesting. The one that, you know, I, I hadn't really thought of the, the poison data problem, but, you know, as we start to do AI and ML and, and companies start to rely on those um, tools and techno techniques more and more and at scale, there are, it introduces a whole new set of challenges that, in privacy and security space that we really haven't had to deal with before because essentially those technologies didn't exist or they didn't exist at the scale that they're going to eventually exist at. Yeah. So with some of the, you know, with your time working with different startups, because of the, these trends that are happening in the industry with, you know, more investment in tools and technologies around security and privacy, are you also seeing more concerns from founders or awareness from founders in terms of early in the development of their product actually being, you know, concerned about privacy and security and, and wanting to prioritize that? I think there's two sides to this. So the first is how do founders respond to this as vendors? Like what do their customers expect from them in privacy and security? And the second is as founders build companies, how do their internal security and privacy policies develop? And, and those two things are separate, sort of separate concerns. On the, from the vendor point of view, uh, you know, I think it's, it's very stage dependent. I find in pre-seed and seed and series A founders that they're really worried about proving that there is a problem that exists and that they can find product market fit with that problem. And so I think privacy and security become sort of baseline considerations for them. Like they understand that passwords should not be leaked <laughs> in any scenario. They know that uh, you, know, you shouldn't be able to do a SQL injection attack on their website. Like these very simple sort of basic things that, that we understand. What I think they're not going to do just yet is uh, you know, data classification at scale, for example because that's not really a requirement that their customers are putting in front of them. I think as they grow and they win more enterprise customers as a vendor, then they start to worry about those things where a customer might say, I don't want your support people to ever look at my employee PII. And then you have to do classification and redaction and in real time for, for any customer environments that you have. And then I think on the other side, you know, as you build a company, how do you invest in security and privacy internally? Um, you know, again, I think that's dependent on your scale and the industry that you operate in. So if you're in fintech or healthcare or defense or, you know, manufacturing or some other sort of highly regulated environment, I, I think it's a good idea to have these standards in place from day one. You might not need a CISO from day one, but you should have some baseline understanding of, uh, you know, we're a least privileged company, we're a zero trust company. We're going to use an identity provider from day one, like these, these very basic things you can do to safeguard your architecture. And then I think as you grow, then you start to have a CISO and a head of privacy and a DevSecOps manager and, and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. And do you, th do you think people are thinking, you know, in the startup world of privacy being a differentiator for their product offering, especially those that are going to eventually be kind of serving the enterprise? 
I think so. So h- historically, you know, this privacy was one of those things that you would build in for admins and it didn't really matter if you had it or not. You just had to get through the procurement process. And this was one of the ways that you could get through it. I think increasingly now that that data has become so valuable and losing it has become so expensive, there is a legitimate competitive advantage to building the best administration layer. And if you compare, uh, you know, let's take three sort of very compelling competitive products like Asana, Atlassian, and Notion, if you went to a larger company, I think they would have concerns over each of those products based on their administration, the way that they handle privacy, the way they handle security. Um, Many companies in enterprise are now investing in trust centers. So these are public places where they list out all of their policies, how they treat data, how they treat employee data, their, their physical access systems, all that kind of stuff. And it's not to win a compliance certification. It's because it's just sort of baseline now that cu- customers and companies are expecting this of them. So I think it is becoming a competitive advantage. I think the other thing is developers are very discerning. So if your API is meaningfully better or worse than a competitor's, that matters for event streaming. It actually matters if your audit logs contain the information they need to contain. And it matters if your real-time event stream for a log is actually real-time or if it updates once a week. And so I think all these things are starting to, to really add up for both for founders and for the customers who are trying to win. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I imagine even in sort of the B2C world, I think consumers now are a lot more aware of what companies are doing with their data and a lot more you know, wary, legitimately wary of uh, giving up that information to different businesses. Uh, and, and that, you know, in itself creates pressure on companies to essentially prioritize privacy as well as differentiate themselves by creating, a, you know, a, a more secure and private uh, infrastructure and, and treat that data like, um, uh, treat that data well. Totally. There was a, a trending tweet from last week that was like, I've unsubscribed from Banana Republic's marketing emails seven times this week. And I think it's really emblematic of, you know, data treatment and identity treatment from these large B2C brands. Uh, It really puts a bad taste in people's mouths if it's not done well. Yeah. Some of the unsubscribe uh, forms are so complicated, it's hard for for me to even understand what I'm trying to do. One of the most shocking things to me was consent management on cookies on a number of consumer websites nothing actually happens once you once you fill out the form you can accept cookies or decline cookies in a lot of websites that input is just dropped because it's really really hard to actually control uh you know what the what the browser is doing with cookies and so i I just thought that was a shocking shocking revelation to me by a founder Mm, yeah that's interesting we we did we talked a little bit on about uh with uh dr lori trainer from cmu about um, essentially the design of those uh, consent forms, cookie consent forms, and that's a whole other you know beast of a topic as well. But what are some of the big challenges in data privacy and security that you think we need to solve as an industry, and that you might be excited about if there was a company that was you know a startup that was going to be bu- building something in that area? Yeah, I think about this in terms of two sort of large problems. The first is that the on-prem world is continuing to transition to the cloud world. And that continues to be a huge concern for a lot of CISOs because security is actually not very well equipped to solve problems in the cloud these days, right? There there isn't really any control over the infrastructure as we've talked about. And data security is a really big part of that. So if you're in a modern engineering organization, you're spinning containers up and down maybe thousands of times a week. You have S3 buckets going up and down many, many times a week. And you kind of have to do this to be a modern entry organization to ship code really quickly. But how do you keep track of knowing that all of your API keys stay secret or that, you know, one S3 bucket didn't happen to make it onto the public internet and is behind an AWS IAM policy. And so part of this is visibility. Visibility in the cloud is really, really hard. We're investors in a company called Jupiter One that is doing things like asset visibility for CISOs. Um, but it's still a, you know, it's a, it's a very challenging problem. Even if you had a list of all the infrastructure that you have to go and, you know, monitor the alerts thrown off by a lot of security tools today, or they, they just drown privacy and security engineers in, in, you know, not knowing which ones to prioritize and how to fix them. So there's sort of a, 
a prioritization and ranking question here. And even if you knew what to go fix, it's really hard to figure out how. So how do you, how do you change the behavior of these applications? Once they've been running in the cloud, they're usually in distributed environments. It's really hard to fix these things once they're actually in production. And so I, I'm really excited about companies fixing one or more parts of that workflow. I think visibility was the story of the last five years. Now we worry more about automation and remediation, right? I think somewhere in the 30,000 alerts a week that are generated, <laughs> there is an alert you should pay attention to, but it's knowing which is the right one and it's knowing how to actually fix it. And better yet, if we know how to fix it, can we do that automatically? Is there some kind of workflow orchestration that can happen to reduce the amount of human work there? So that, that's sort of one broad area, the cloud and transitioning to it. The second is, you know, a lot of the data that's being generated these days is unstructured. It's really hard to store in a database, very hard to query, really hard to make use of, right? This is unstructured bits of text and it's images and it's Excel spreadsheets and it's emails and PDFs and all these things that exist in a modern enterprise. Using that data is still really, really hard. So I, I'm really excited about pre-processing companies that can basically ETL data out of these super hostile environments and get it into a place where we can structure it and we can you know, do operations on it. I'm really excited about AI ML techniques to fine tune large models on that data. And then really excited about companies that are figuring out ways to protect those models from prying eyes and uh, you know, data poisoning and things like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those are a lot of really exciting, exciting areas uh, to pay attention to. And do you think, you know, in the next five to 10 years, is this, are these challenges going to get easier for companies? Uh, you know, we have more and more companies that are moving from the on-prem world to the cloud world, modernizing infrastructure, and they're going to be, you know, dealing with a lot of these challenges when it comes to sort of the, the cloud space for the first time. Do you think we're going to have essentially tools, technologies, uh, in, in processes in place that it's going to make this easier? I think so. I mean, I'm, I'm very optimistic. And to some extent, a lot of that work has been happening over the last few years, right? Like it wasn't actually clear that you needed an identity provider to do federated auth until Okta came along and made that common practice. And so I think if you're starting a company now and you don't have an IDP, it's kind of a head scratcher. It's, it's sort of a default option now. I, I think a lot of the startups have a significant market education problem ahead of them where they have to become the default and they have to convince all of these CIOs and, and VPs of IT at larger companies that this is the way that a company should be laid out. But I think there's a really big opportunity to do that for a lot of these companies. So that, that's part one. I think the second thing is, you know, the transition is getting a lot easier. Like Snowflake made the, the data transition in much easier than it used to be before, because the whole point of a warehouse is it should be your centralized repository for everything. And so you should be able to put all of your data into, into Snowflake. Then we have the modern data stack. So Fivetran and Hightouch are the accepted ways to take data in and out of that warehouse. And you can push it in and out of a variety of tools. You can build your own connectors to internal tools, all that kind of stuff. And so we're, we're seeing it on data. We saw it in compute, right, EC2 and all the other sort of primitives that the hyperscalers offer. And we're seeing it in network. So there's a number of sort of SD-WAN and SASE companies that are helping you do software-defined networks in the cloud without having to do a, a secure web gateway or a, a VPN or anything like that. So I, I think it's only going to get easier. I think the fact that modern companies are built in the cloud, it's not really a question of cloud or not, is sort of evidence of that. The question is how do we make data and security engineering equally first-class citizens in the cloud. And, and I'm excited about a bunch of companies that are doing that. Like there's, there's Panther Labs, which is, you know, making it easy for people to build detections in code before you can do that. And so that makes it much more accessible to your average data engineer, security engineer, software engineer to wrangle security data. Um, Tynes and Torque are two companies that are addressing the data orchestration problem. So once you have the data, you know that things are going wrong, you have alerts, how can you take actions automatically? And they're, they're quickly becoming standards for forward-thinking CISOs. So I think a lot of it is culture, and there are a lot of companies that are really capitalizing on that culture shift. Yeah, and there's a lot of um, really interesting tools now that 
you know, essentially integrate into your CI/CD pipeline as well, and like can do essentially secure improve your security and privacy posture from a like a, a code deployment model as well. Uh, there's so much development that's going on. It's really really exciting time I think to be in the space of privacy and, and security as uh, you know an engineer or product person. Is there anything else you'd like to share this time? No, I think I think that was great. All right, thanks, Rock, for for doing this. You know, I only enjoy uh, when we get a chance to talk. I think uh, one of the great things, or at least I assume it's the case, if I've never been an investor, but it seems like when you work in venture, you get exposed to so many different companies. You build up a really unique and informed perspective on kind of what's going on there, and I think that really you know came through uh, during this conversation. So thanks for joining. You know, sharing your perspective on this, talking a little bit about. You know, your experience building some of those security and privacy features at Atlassian. And, and uh, thanks for coming on and cheers. Yeah, thanks for having me, Sean. And always a huge fan of what you and Skyflower are up to. Awesome.